welcome to 2023 with Agnes Kunkel. In 2020, the world was hit by COVID-19. It was like a time machine. Find out what the world might look like in spring 2023 and how we will need to adapt. 2023, your window to a world beyond COVID-19. It's a calm Tuesday afternoon. Xenia and Thomas are sitting together in the living room after lunch to drink tea. Melanie enters, rushing excitedly to them after she just found out about the tree sponsorship project in the neighborhood. Mum, Dad, I want to sponsor a lime tree. Both parents were already expecting this to come up when they first heard about the revitalization project that came as a part of the city's restoration and revival plan after the corona pandemic, so they were not too much surprised at hearing Melanie's wish. As a young, passionate, eco-friendly girl, Melanie is excited to be a part of this project. Lime trees adapt perfectly to climate changes, are beneficial for insects, birds, and small animals, and they have a very refreshing smell. She suggests using money from her savings account to sponsor her chosen lime tree. When Xenia asks about the price of one tree sponsoring, she is surprised to hear that it's 500 euros. She tries to explain to Melanie that this amount of money was saved for her future school year abroad. Melanie is still not convinced and replies, It's important that the bird population stays stable and not goes extinct like I heard yesterday on the radio. That would be terrible. As Christy overhears the conversation, she stands by her sister and wants to sponsor a tree as well. Then Thomas starts to explain to the young girl how important it is to actually take care of a tree. It is not money that matters. The important thing is helping the tree grow every day. In fact, when you volunteer to take responsibility of more trees, you do get a reduction on the money cost because that's the real work needed. Christy and Melanie get excited to volunteer for taking care of the neighborhood trees. Melanie says, In this case, I will even get up a little bit earlier so that I can water the trees before school. Her mother Zenia nods, asking, May I remind you when it is time? Christy then interrupts, saying, In the summer, when the trees need watering, there is already light outside in the morning. I would love to get up early and wake Melanie up with me. Hello. I'm Agnes Kunkel, your host in 2023, your window to the world beyond COVID-19. Today, we have over 20.1 million confirmed cases worldwide and over 737,000 people have confirmed to have died from COVID-19. The curve of daily infections seems to have flattened just below 300,000 cases per day. We have over 160 vaccine projects around the world. A vaccine, at least for the people at the front line, seems to be at hand in two to three months. Looks like some light at the end of the tunnel. Today is 11th of August 2020. Our guest today is Bill Fulton, Director of Kinder Institute of Urban Research at Rice University, Houston, Texas. There are only a few people who truly influence our world. Bill Fulton is one of those people one of the world's leading urban planners and innovative thinkers, not only by his tremendous scientific work, but also by his practical experience as a politician and mayor in Ventura, California. He is an incredible productive writer, has authored books like Guide to Planning in California and The Reluctant Metropolis, The Politics of Urban Growth in Los Angeles, which has been a bestseller on the struggles and partnerships between politics, business, and individuals that have formed or deformed Los Angeles. In 2009, he was named to Planet Tyson's list of 100 top urban thinkers. Since 2014, he is director of the Kinder Institute of Urban Research at Rice University in Houston, Texas, under his leadership, it has become a globally leading think tank on urban planning. Bill Fulton is one of the people who really owns a crystal ball. He is the one who can tell us what our cities will look like in 2023 and what we can do so that in 2023 our cities will be much more better places to live. Building better cities, building better lives. Let's get inspired by what Bill Fulton has to tell us about the future of our cities. Welcome, Bill Fulton. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. 
Oh, Bill, you are a highly productive scientist, thinker and writer with many activities and partners around the world. How have the changes in the last few months changed your own life and your scientific work? Well, it's done both. Uh, like most people, I've been working at home since March. Uh, finally, this week with school opening up, uh, I'm going back to the office two days a week. Uh, and of course, I haven't been traveling around as I usually do. Um, what it has really done to our work, though, is help us understand uh, how cities are, think about and try to understand how cities are changing as a result of the COVID crisis. And really, there are a couple of themes coming up. Uh, we realize that that uh, there are going to be more extreme events affecting cities in the future. You know, um, uh, one of the things that many people often say is more than half of the people who in the in the world now live in cities. So one of the things I like to say is every human problem is an urban problem, right? So uh, as extreme events of various kinds affect cities, you know, we're we're trying to figure out how to learn from that and how to help cities become more resilient and more flexible mm -hmm. uh, so that they can accommodate those. Also here in the US, we've seen significantly highlighting uh, uh, economic inequality as a result of COVID. Uh, many people uh, who are more affluent are able to work at home and lead, lead pretty comfortable lives. Many essential workers still have to take the bus to work, uh, don't make very much money. They've had their income cut, and and I'm very worried that there's going to be a major rental housing crisis in the U.S. as more and more people can't pay their rent as a result of the COVID-induced economic crisis. Mm -hmm. So um, that, uh, of course, uh, deep influence. Uh, as I dived really into the publications you have already done exactly on this title, more or less, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the influence of COVID-19 on the urban city centers, I would say I got, we will have a lot more of remote work and we have many signals yeah. from different sources that uh, remote work will stay and it will increase its uh, part and that we will lose shops in the city centers. Looks like a bit like our city centers could be quite deserted and empty, not very pleasant uh, panorama. Uh, in the short term, I think that will be true, that not only city centers, but also suburban shopping centers uh, will be emptied out to a certain extent. So there's really two things going on here. One is the question of how many people are going to continue to work remotely when COVID is over. And I think the answer is many more people are going to work remotely part of the time and go to the office less often. Mm. This will probably mean less demand for office space in city centers and other large jo mm -hmm. jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so in the short term, that's probably a bad thing. In the long term, I think we'll see a transition toward um, more entertainment, more residential in city centers. Um, but in addition to that, the other, the other pattern, which I think is not going to change, is the increasing growth of online retailing, online buying, And that is going to mean, as you said, many of our shops, especially our local shops, but chains as well, are going to close. Uh, and we'll have big gaping holes in our city centers and in our, and in our suburban shopping centers, at least in the short run. Mm. And what we do with it, so we'll have an excess of office space and excess of retail space. And it'll be very interesting to see what we do with all that space. <laughs> That's a really the big, big, big question. When you say we will... Don't, we don't go for shopping, maybe less. No, of course, we go to, to a city to shop. Of course, we go to the city to work, but we do it less. And yes. in a quite significant proportion less. So uh, what does make a city attractive to people? Well, I think that one of the great things, there's two great things about cities. One is there's a, a diversity of activities, mm. right? Uh, so you go to a city center, whether you're in the US or Europe, or Asia, and you have not just offices, not just residences, but but um, entertainment venues, restaurants and bars, once they open, all open back <laughs> up again, which they will, um, cultural facilities, sports arenas, uh, all these different th uh, theaters, all these different things that people like to do in a concentrated area. So I think one of the attractive things is that people are going to want to participate in all those activities again. And one of the things we know about cities is that people really like 
to um, be together in close proximity to one another, which currently they can't be, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but when COVID is over, and as you said at the top of the show, there are some encouraging signs, and uh, we may see light at the end of the tunnel, people are going to want to get back out there and mix it up again and be in close proximity to one another. And that's really the attraction that cities provide. Uh, are our cities prepared to attract people as uh, mainly our cities here in Europe are designed to comfort cars, but not so much to comfort <laughs> people walking uh, on a walking or riding a bicycle? Yeah. You know, well, I think what you see in both the U.S. and Europe is uh, increasingly, yes, people may go to the city center in their car, mm -hmm. um, but they will, uh, whether that's to work or whether that's to shop or whether that's to go to an entertainment venue, But once they're there, they're less likely to use their car. They're more likely to walk around or even use bike share to bike around uh, a city center to do various things. Um, one thing I will say is that, and this is impossible to predict at this point, <clears throat> it's entirely possible that our traffic patterns will change and that if a lot of people remain uh, uh, working remotely at least part of the time, that may mean that there's a little less pressure on our rush hours. There are somewhat fewer cars out on the street, at least at that time of day. Mm -hmm. uh, and so people might not be so uh, uh, um, reluctant to go to city centers and inner cities if the traffic is loosened up a little bit. We'll see. I'm, I can't predict for sure that's going to happen because traffic always seems to get worse everywhere, no matter what. Uh, <laughs> but I But I do think that the, the, there might be a change in traffic patterns during the course of each day. When you are walking or riding a bicycle, you uh, like to have a little bit more green, maybe to have some fountains and space for the children to play. Could this be important to keep uh, city centers attractive? Yes, I think so. We already see. So I live in uh, Houston, Texas, not which is very different from the typical European city, mm -hmm. right? It's very auto oriented And our downtown, which I live near, it was pretty much until recently has been nothing but office, large office buildings, many of them built in the 70s and 80s. And they were designed for you to drive into the parking garage, go up to your <laughs> office and drive out at the end of the day. Many of those office buildings are being retrofitted at the ground level for to have shops, restaurants, a little bit of green space so that people can walk around more. That was already happening. Uh, and I think that in order to be, remain competitive, yes, city centers are going to have to uh, create uh, uh, places to walk and to bike that are as attractive as possible. Um, in the U.S., certainly, uh, that's not the norm in the suburbs, right, because uh, uh, the suburbs are very auto-oriented in the U.S. So in city, in, in city centers and also in other city neighborhoods near city centers, the ability to walk and bike pleasantly is a unique asset that can attract people. Mm -hmm. uh, I have read in your publications about the Green Spy U Greenway project. To me, it looks a little bit, of course, in a very modern way, like the big parks that were built in the 19th century in Europe, uh, in the outer skirt of the yeah. cities, the residential cities. So to build parks not only for the king and the queen uh, and the high ranking people, but maybe to uh, create parks uh, for everyone. For everyone, yes. Um, Houston has been very uh, ambitious in the last few years in creating uh, uh, greenways along our bayous. Mm -hmm. Bayous are what our local term for river. A bayou means a very yeah. slow-moving, sluggish, muddy river. Um, and uh, Houston is built around a series of bayous that flow into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so we have undertaken a very ambitious program in the last 10 years to create greenways along something like 120 uh, miles of bayous, including along Green's Bayou, as you mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, and one of the great things about this program, like you say, is that, is that we have excellent parks in affluent neighborhoods. Uh, in the old days, that would have been for the king and queen. <laughs> uh, uh, but now it's for the millionaires and the billionaires. Um, uh, but these Greenways throughout Houston, including the Greens Bayou one, the Greens Bayou one in particular, which is near the airport, uh, will serve many low-income neighborhoods and, mm -hmm. and people uh, who work for modest wages who will be able to, to take advantage of them. And if they have a bicycle, get on them and go mm -hmm. for many, many miles. Mm -hmm. uh, has the perception of the project changed during COVID and uh, these uh, restrictions? 
I think the perception of parks and open space generally has changed because all spring, that was pretty much the only place you could go and the only thing you could do um, uh, throughout the U.S. And, and, and including here in Houston, all spring from March through Memorial Day, mm -hmm. uh, the restaurants were closed, the bars were closed, the bars are still closed, <laughs> most of the stores were closed. People weren't going to work. The only thing you could do would be would be to go out and walk in the parks and along the bayous. I live near Buffalo Bayou, the mm. main bayou here in mm. Houston, and <clears throat> social distancing became somewhat difficult because it was because walking <laughs> along the bayou was so popular because it was the only thing to do. Yeah. So actually, I think the importance of parks and open space and our greenways along the bayous ha has grown, and people have come to appreciate them far more because of the COVID situation. Mm. Uh, I have read uh, it's a really sounds like a wonderful project, but it doesn't keem, come for free, as I understand. And <laughs> <laughs> so, my no, it doesn't. <laughs> what, 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 in Houston, it's a combination of philanthropic money and tax money, about half and half. Um, uh, our parks board has raised about $220 million dollars to build these greenways. Mm. Uh, as I say, about half of it from philanthropic donations and about half of it fr from tax money. Um, and that's always a major issue, uh, particularly in the U.S., particularly in a place like Texas, which doesn't like taxes very much, mm -hmm. right, where we don't like taxes very much. But people have been more than willing to support parks, mm -hmm. uh, actually all throughout Texas, Houston, Dallas, and elsewhere. Have you ideas or concepts? Uh, what could a city do that does not have oil billionaires and millionaires for <laughs> philanthropic uh, support? Well, well, that that is a major part of life here in Houston, and one of the things that uh, the city is grappling with right now is is uh, in the long term future, twenty forty, twenty fifty, not just twenty twenty three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But But not just but 2040, 2050. Do you want? Does Houston want? Is Houston still going to be the oil and gas capital in the world, mm. or is Houston going to truly be the the energy capital of the world? Mm. However, energy mm -hmm. is produced at that time. Now, that's one of the major debates in Houston now, and of course, diversifying the economy with our large medical center and and other things like and 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 mm. our space center. Uh, are, are major topics. Of and scientific, the big scientific triangle you have. Uh, yes, right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what, what do cities do that do not have uh, billionaires and millionaires for supporting <laughs> parks and outdoor spaces well, and transforming? Yeah. Right. I, and, and I will say that, that when I uh, lived in Ventura in California and was the mayor, that was a city that did not have billionaires. It had affluent people, but it didn't have billionaires. And it was a common in those in those places. It was a combination of relatively minor philanthropic donations mm. by individual people, mm. along with work by along with a lot of work by our city, uh, which I led at the time, as well as the state, uh, to protect open space and and to build and to build new trails and and greenways. Mm. Um, uh, uh, I it's a it's a it's a different solution in different locations. Mm. But 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 you're right that we are fortunate in Houston to have. Mm very wealthy, philanthropically minded people who have helped us out. Uh, but I guess uh, it should not, the money should not be the threshold. Uh, I think the cities should be improved. And as you say, maybe by some crowdfunding uh, uh, initiatives and yeah. maybe doing things yourself and, and sharing the burden of maintaining, think, maintaining such infrastructure and, and all that stuff as we do. Yeah, it's a combination of all those things. And as I say, uh, in Houston, the, um, the the voters did approve overwhelmingly a $120 million dollar bond paid back by mm -hmm. their property taxes to, to help pay for the greenways. You talked about the big office buildings where you drive in the <laughs> parking garage. <laughs> You go straight to the elevator, you yeah. never go outside. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And everything is filtered and ventilated and air conditioned. What will happen to these affluent large office buildings? What can we transform? Do you have ideas how to transform a part, of course, a part? Yeah, I think I think what's gonna happen actually is that offices there'll be less there'll be less need for office space if people work more remotely more often, right? So Office, the offices that are needed will consolidate into the newer office buildings. Many of the older office buildings, and this is already happening, certainly mm -hmm. around the U.S., in downtowns, in city centers, 
uh, will be converted to residential use. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as our downtowns and our city centers have become more diverse in the sense that there are many, many different activities, they mm -hmm. become more attractive for people who like urban life. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is fairly new in the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's not new at all in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we've seen in Los Angeles, where I used to live, uh, and elsewhere, and a little bit in Houston, we've seen older office buildings transformed into lofts mm -hmm. uh, and apartments and condominiums. And I expect we'll see that happen in a big way over mm -hmm. the next few years. So we'll see a lot of empty office buildings for a while, and that will harm our city centers. But in the long run, I think we will see a lot of those office buildings reborn as residential buildings. Uh, that's maybe what you talk about when you talk about hotels. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, the, the, what, I've what I've said is that the future of city centers and downtowns are to serve as the urban hotel. And kind of what I mean by that is, is a little bit more than just residential buildings. Mm -hmm. What I mean is that um, downtowns and city centers will become places where people, where face-to-face -face contact occurs, whether for business purposes or social purposes, uh, when you want to get together and be actually see each other in person, face-to-face, -face, you go to a city center, you go to a downtown, because that is well-suited to, to do mm. that. Mm. Um, that might be uh, why you, you know, that might be why you office in a downtown part of the time. You could, as I am currently doing, sit in your spare bedroom in your house and do your work when you're just doing your work by yourself. But when you have to have, when you have to interact with somebody, when you have to meet with somebody and when only that face to face contact mm. will work in a business setting, that's when you go to the city center or the downtown. Mm. Mm. Or if you live in an outlying area, perhaps that's when you come in and literally stay in a hotel in a mm. downtown to do that for a couple of days. Um, as you mentioned, you go to the city for a few days. Might it happen that many people have more places to live? Maybe, as you say, a micro apartment for their office job and maybe a greater uh, place where the family is living and maybe some other place where the husband is working, as maybe not everyone is working in the same city uh, and maybe something you share with your friends in the countryside. Uh, well, I think the big unanswered question is if people work remotely more often and they don't go to uh, the office as office workers I'm speaking of, and they don't go to the office as often ever or hardly ever, or as often as they do now, where are they going to want to live? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and a lot of people, particularly in the U S urban pundits have said, well, they want, they're going to want to live out in the edge of the suburbs, right. Where they can buy a bigger house cheaper and so forth. And I think that's somewhat true, but it's not quite right. I think what people will do is they will have more of an ability to live where they want to live rather than being tethered to a commute. For some people, yes, that will be a big house on the metropolitan fringe. For other people, it will be an apartment in the middle of the city. I'm not sure very many people will be able to afford multiple residences, mm -hmm. but I do think that people will, uh, uh, be, as I say, be able to live the lifestyle they want to live rather than the lifestyle they are kind of forced into because they are tethered to a commute to a particular location. In some cases, that might mean living in the suburbs. In some cases, it might mean living mm. in the city center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about prices for real estate and rents? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, it, it, that's, there's a complicated interaction there, right? Because Uh, office and retail rents will undoubtedly go down. Mm -hmm. um, what we've seen during the COVID crisis, interestingly enough, is a lot of residential real estate prices, a lot of housing prices have gone up. Mm -hmm. uh, no one expected. But I think that's because uh, places where people want to live have become more valuable. So um, it's a little hard to tell right now what's going to happen to real estate prices in the long run. Uh, 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 because, as I say, there'll be a lot of vacant office and retail space and office and retail rents will be low. Mm. Uh, if a lot of uh, those spaces are converted to housing, that might moderate housing price rise. But at the moment, it certainly looks like housing prices are going to continue to go up mm. as, as desirable places, whether they're in the suburbs or the city, become more desirable because you're stuck mm. at home all the time. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people are saying, I'm stuck at home all the time. I'm not commuting. Yeah. So where do I really want to live? And they seek those places out. And that's part of the reason that we've seen real estate prices go up since the beginning of the, of the COVID uh, pandemic. 
it's quite the same here in Germany. The uh, uh, attractive areas to have a house or a, a larger apartment, they are stable or even still rising. Yes. What, yes. Uh, what it was surprised, seemed to surprise some people, but not to me as I, when you understand exactly what you said. Um, what this does this as we are now talking about the suburbias as we say the city center may be less less uh, people less shops in the short run maybe later it changes what does this mean for maybe the high street in the high street uh, <laughs> in the suburban areas that's a really good question because i have a theory about that which may or may not be true but <clears throat> but a couple of things i think number one is Some people uh, will not want to go to the office in the city center, but they, for a variety of reasons, they may not want to work at home. Mm -hmm. So it may be that many of these vacant retail spaces will be converted into small co-working spaces, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So instead of going to the, driving to the city center every day or taking a train to the city center, you drive a very short distance to your local um, shopping center, which used to have mm -hmm. uh, some kind of retail store in it, but now has a, a A, a co-working space, a kind of a WeWork type space. Yeah, 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 exactly. Where yeah. you can go and where you can go and for a very small amount of money, you or your company can rent the desk, and yeah, that's yeah. where you work. Yeah. So I think that's one thing that's going to happen. The other thing, although how widespread that's going to be, I don't know. The second thing I think is if people spend most or all of their time in their suburban neighborhood rather than commuting to the city center, they're going to want more things out of that suburban neighborhood there the the high street as you say mm. um may well become more interesting mm. uh, 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 there there may be uh, what in in american terms what i've said is uh if you are at home all the time and you never commute to the city center are you really going to be satisfied that the only restaurant in your neighborhood is an applebee's which is, <laughs> a, a, which is an american uh generic chain restaurant yeah. it may so it may well be that pe if people uh, who work at home or near home rather than in the city center have more time and money to spend on the suburban high street, uh, that suburban high street eventually uh, becomes more interesting and gets a greater diversity of stores and restaurants. Many shops will close, but I really think restaurants and bars, uh, once the pandemic is over, will thrive yeah, and, and yeah. come back. And there may be a greater variety and more interesting bar bars and restaurants on suburban high streets than there were in the past. That's my theory. Uh, I don't know how true that's going to be. <laughs> uh, uh, when we think about, when you think about your experiences during the uh, pandemic, have you changed something where you say, okay, I like it and I will stick to it when the pandemic has gone? You mean me personally? You as a person, exactly. Oh, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure I'm never going to go to the office on a Friday again. <laughs> I've, I've, as I said, Rice University has reopened. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the students are coming back. Um, we've gone back to the office at the Kinder Institute on a limited basis. Um, I'm currently going to the office two days a week. I can imagine that it'll step up to three or four, but... Um, Uh, like everybody else, I'm learning there's no particular reason for me to go to the office just to sit in front of my computer and type. <laughs> um, it, it makes perfect sense for me to go to the office and to go to the campus um, in order to meet with other people, either people on our staff or people across the campus. Um, but you don't have to do that 40 hours a week, right? You can do that three days a week, six hours a day or something like that. So I think For me personally, as an office worker, that's probably the future. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, 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 I'll work at home more and at the office less. And again, going to the office or to the campus, in my case, really is in order to facilitate face-to-face -face contact, mm -hmm. uh, not really to, to, to do, down. not really just to sit and type on the computer. Yeah. Right. Bill, it was wonderful to have you with us. I guess Thank our... You. Our 30 minutes you uh, sponsored uh, for us uh, are, are over and uh, we are really very, very happy to have heard what you see in the future for the cities. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye you very then. much for having me. And uh, I guess I'll see you on Zoom and not in a city center from now on, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Right. Bye bye. Bye. 
You've been listening to 2023. To get in touch with us with your comments or ideas, or if you'd like to be a guest on the show, just email hello at 20-23.earth. You can find even more material, including transcripts of our interviews, on our website at 20-23.earth. Please keep in mind, the content of this podcast is our opinion. We work hard to get our facts right. However, if you find something that can be corrected or improved, please email us at hello at 20-23.earth. If you haven't already done so, we'd be grateful if you would subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you happen to listen. Thanks for listening, stay safe, and there will be springtime in 2023.